Hello and welcome. I'm Lynn Fries, producer of TPE News Docs. In a conversation with guest Jim Thomas, this segment looks into the issue of the integration of artificial intelligence with synthetic biology, what's called generative biology. We'll look into the grand scale yet poorly understood implications for people, nature, and the economy of this new technology, and how fueled by the world's largest digital tech companies, generative biology hype is undermining agendas of vital public interest. This in key realms like biosafety, so the protection of human, animal, and environmental health from biological risks, and biopiracy, the unethical appropriation of biological resources or traditional knowledge without proper compensation or consent. We'll look at this in the context of the 2024 summit at the world's premier global platform for governance of biotechnology, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, or CBD. The 2024 summit, COP16, to the CBD was held in Cali, Colombia. The prior summit, COP15, to the CBD was held in Montreal in 2022. Our guest, Jim Thomas, served as a member of the UN CBD's expert technical group on synthetic biology. It was on the recommendation of its expert group that in 2022, the CBD established a process of horizon scanning, assessment, and monitoring of new developments in synthetic biology. With this decision, the CBD, so the Biodiversity COP, continued along a path that differentiated itself from the UNFCCC, so the Climate COP, where Corporate capture of environmental regulation in the UN system has become an issue. This apparent and outcomes reported from COP21 in Paris to COP28 in Dubai into the present summits uh, under the auspices of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, so the UNFCCC. Subsequent recommendations of the CBD expert group identified the integration of AI and synthetic biology as an urgent key issue for the CBD to address through deep dive technology assessment. In the lead up to the 2024 Biodiversity Summit, a big question raised by Jim Thomas and other experts was whether or not the CBD would follow that recommendation at COP16. In other words, would the CBD separate hype from reality or jump onto the generative biology bandwagon? In his report, Black Box Biotech, as well as in an online briefing with other experts, Jim Thomas has addressed all the above. GPE News Docs carried this story on October 4th in a video report published under this title, Black Box Biotech. And today's conversation, uh, recorded November 5th, is a sequel to that series. Jim Thomas is a researcher, writer, and strategist with almost three decades of experience tracking emerging technologies, ecological change, biodiversity, on behalf of movements, and UN fora. About two years ago, he launched ScanTheHorizon.org, where he posts on his current work. Prior to this, Thomas was co-executive director and research director of the ETC group. Welcome, Jim. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. So, Jim, you were in Cali for the full three weeks of COP16, and I see on your homepage, scanthehorizon.org, you already uploaded a COP16 rundown. So, Jim, for those of us who are not seasoned watchers of this space, start by giving us a handle on some basics on the agenda pursued by the UN CBD throughout its long history and what's changed uh, this time around at the 2024 summit. Sure. So, what just wrapped up in Cali, in Colombia, was the 16th Conference of the Parties for the Convention on Biodiversity, sometimes called CBD. Um, And this is a convention that's been around now about 25 years. It came out of the Earth Summit in 1992. And it was really the premiere of those uh, three summits that came out, the the Desertification Summit, the the Climate COP, and, and this Biodiversity COP. And it deals with a wide range of environmental issues. And, and really for most of that 25 years, 
the Biodiversity Convention has been concerned with uh, precaution, particularly over genetically modified food and crops. Um, it's been concerned about trying to deal with, uh, you know, putting in place regulation and guidelines to protect biological diversity and to scan new threats. Um, and, and so the questions around genetic engineering, what's now called synthetic biology, the questions around sharing um, uh, the benefits from using biodiversity, whether that's using DNA or, or, or other things, um, that, that's been at the heart of the convention now for 25 years. Um, but it's changing. And, and, and part of why it's changing is we're seeing a sort of uh, a new agenda at the COP, at the CBD, um, which has really come across from the climate COP, but is also where tech companies, finance companies are seeing a new opportunity here. They want to turn biodiversity into new financial markets. They're thinking that they can set up biodiversity markets and biodiversity credits, just like we have carbon markets and carbon credits. Um, in order to achieve that, they're bringing in new technologies, um, new monitoring technologies, uh, new genetic engineering technologies. And so in some ways, the CBD is now becoming a marketplace for quite uh, cutting edge digital and genetic engineering technologies as a, a way to manage the problems of, of the environment and, and biodiversity collapse. And, and so what was going on in, in, in Cali was really two cops. On the one hand, you had uh, the, the, the long time agenda of trying to protect um, the environment and, um, and protect the rights of smallholders and peasants and indigenous people whose, whose uh, resources have been taken away from them and used by industry. Um, and at the same time, you had industry itself, both the big finance industry and the big tech companies um, trying to create new new markets in, in things like artificial intelligence, synthetic biology, uh, new digital monitoring markets. So it was quite an interesting clash of these two agendas. So comment on who uh, the industry leaders are that uh, are promoting this agenda behind the scenes, uh, as well as on the floor of the COP16. So who, for example, are some of the lead companies in this space? Yeah, it's it's quite startling to see which com companies are leading in so-called generative biology, this new artificial intelligence design, genetic engineering. It's not companies with any history of doing genetic engineering or even any history of biology. It is large tech companies such as Microsoft, Google, NVIDIA, Alibaba, Salesforce. Um, they're the ones who are now setting up these... these uh, these platforms which will design proteins, which will design viruses, that will design RNA, which will design organisms, um, and then partnering with, uh, with chemical companies, with pharmaceutical companies, with food companies. Um, and and they, they certainly don't have any history on carefully managing biosafety risks. Um, and what they do have a history of is, is very successfully creating monopolies very successfully uh, moving ahead of government regulation and, and getting their, their, their technologies out there into commercial use before any kind of, uh, any kind of controls can be put in place. So, so that's worrying to see literally the world's most powerful, well-capitalized companies jumping on this, this bandwagon. In part, I think they're doing it because their AI platforms, whether that's ChatGPT or Gemini and so forth, um, aren't, aren't delivering much. They've spent billions of dollars, in fact, almost trillions of dollars, building out AI platforms that have really just created a few chatbots. And the, finance, uh, the financiers are saying, what, what are we getting for our money? So they need to be able to show that Ultimately, they're going to get drugs, they're going to get foods, they're going to get um, new materials, they're going, to, they're going to be able to create energy solutions. Um, so that's, that's why they're moving into this. But they're doing so at a pace and with, with a lack of accountability that's really quite scary. So on the topic of leaders in generative biology, I understand DARPA, which of course stands for Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, is a significant funder of research in areas related to generative biology and uh, synthetic biology. As we all know, DARPA is part of the U.S. Department of Defense. So my question being, 
Is the role of militaries in uh, this push for generative biology uh, being discussed? The role of militaries in so-called generative biology and also synthetic biology is is the really large elephant in the room. Um, that because you can use generative biology platforms to create new toxins or to create new viruses, um, every military around the world is concerned about this or excited about it. Um, and there are ongoing discussions at the Munich, con the, the Munich Convention meetings or the Bioweapons Convention meetings um, around how to deal with the new risks, the bioweapons risks and the toxins risks coming from generative biology. Of course, this is a bit of, like everything, this is a double-edged sword. Um, it makes those companies become important for national security. Um, and it also potentially closes down discussions on the wider impacts um, because, you know, the states want to have control over how they build new bioweapons, new toxins. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely part of the conversation, but it's not, it's not being discussed in the Convention on Biodiversity openly. So on this point you made at the open, what's changed at COP16 to the CBD is that now big tech, big finance, uh, see an opportunity to turn biodiversity into new financial markets. So to set up biodiversity markets, biodiversity credits, the CBD has now become an important platform uh, for these kinds of players. Having already set up carbon markets and carbon credits at the UNFCC, so the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, these players have now set their sights on the CBD uh, for an opportunity to expand uh, this agenda of uh, the push into a financialization of nature. So in short, historically, unlike the cl climate COP, negotiations at the biodiversity COP, and so agenda setting at the UN CBD has not uh, been of much interest to uh, big tech, big finance players up until now. I, I, think, I think that's right. Um, that because the convention has really been a place for, for working from a position of precaution, and the precautionary principle is really important there, um, it's, it's, it's made decisions that often have been about restraining industrial um, uh, attacks on biodiversity. Uh, and also, it's, it has built into it um, a, lot of, a lot of work about trying to regulate genetic engineering and biotechnology, trying to ensure that uh, genetic resources, that's to say DNA, seeds, germplasm, isn't being stolen from indigenous peoples and, and, um, and communities. And, and all of that is, is not what big, big tech, big biotech, big finance is interested in. Um, so it's often been a sort of backwater in, in UN environmental negotiations, but that's changing now. Um, and one of the things that's shifted, for example, and it really came out very clearly in this COP, was that you've got a big push now by the industry to transform the agenda to a sort of industrial promotion agenda. Um, where rather than regulating and overseeing the, the sort of negative impacts of, say, synthetic biology, that's the extreme genetic engineering, the, um, the push now is to, to promote it, to say this is a fix for our biodiversity problems, this is a fix for our climate problems, and that there should be more money flowing into building these kind of risky, um, still quite speculative technologies, um, these techno fixes. So that came over very strongly. Um, as well as um, an attempt to set up funds. Um, for example, um, there is a fund that was now set up, it was just agreed, where um, industries that use genetic resources, that is to say they use the gene sequences um, from, from plants and animals and bacteria and the ocean um, in order to create, uh, let's say, pharmaceuticals or to make genetically engineered crops, are expected now to pay into a fund. Um, there's this fund around what was called digital sequence information, that is the, the digital version of, of the genetic sequences, the DNA sequences, um, is, is now going to be called the Kali Fund. Um, uh, there was continual day and night negotiations for two weeks to try and get this Kali Fund established, and it was established. And industry 
not only has to pay into this, but thinks they're going to get money out of this. They hope to set it up so that they can use that money to, to grab more DNA, for example, or to train people in using genetic engineering. So it's a, it's a two-edged sword. As background on how we got to where we are in all this and with the Kali Fund, talk about ways the changes you're talking about have worked to undermine uh, the long-standing agenda of the CBD. Let's take the issue of biosafety first, which, as I indicated at the open, concerns the protection of human, animal, and environmental health from biological risks. So let's take a big environmental issue, the uh, crossing of planetary boundaries. When you talk about planetary boundaries and the planetary boundaries that have been set up um, around, you know, over overreaching over nitrogen use and, and uh, water use and carbon dioxide emissions and so forth. One of those planetary boundaries is about novel entities. Um, and often that refers to new chemicals, which have caused a massive impact on biodiversity, but it's also novel living entities. This is exactly what drove the Convention on Biodiversity to be framed around biosafety, that if you're developing new genetically engineered organisms that can reproduce in the environment that act in unpredictable ways, um, then they can very quickly uh, disrupt the web of life. Um, and one of the breaks on new genetic engineering organisms impacting biodiversity has been that it's slow at the moment. It's been slow to create a new genetically engineered organism to get it out into the environment. And that's what's changed with synthetic biology and now with artificial intelligence. Um, it's now increasingly quick and easy to, to generate new genetic codes that somewhat seem to work, to transfer them into living organisms, whether that's bacteria or even viruses, um, or, or into other organisms such as plants and animals. Um, and increasingly, there's a focus on putting them into organisms that are going to be in nature, whether that's insects, um, or, or, or bacteria and so forth. Um, so, so the danger is that with the, the use of artificial intelligence to design increasingly novel organisms, you're going to see many more synthetic organisms being released, and um, certainly more than, than uh, biosafety regulators are able to easily regulate. Um, and also we're seeing a big focus on creating new proteins um, that you can genetically engineer novel proteins, whether for food or for materials or for um, drugs that, that never previously were possible. Um, and those two, there's a concern coming that those could over, overwhelm regulators um, uh, or, or just, be, just be produced without regulation. Um, so so we're, we're sort of at a tipping point if not already soon, where we're going to see a volume of new entities, whether that's proteins, whether that's organisms or viruses, being produced for the marketplace, for environmental release, honestly also for other uses, um, that, that, that biosafety regulations aren't really uh, capable or have the capacity to deal with. Um, and one of the really big questions with designing organisms by artificial intelligence is, what errors are they going to be? We, we've seen that when you ask an artificial intelligence, generative artificial intelligence platform to create a picture or write a text, it's riddled with errors. You get people with six fingers, you get um, uh, text in which nonsense is written. Um, that's, that's kind of funny when it's just text and pictures. It's not so funny when it's a living organism that can reproduce and spread in the environment. Um, so that's why we were arguing and, and other countries, some countries were arguing there needed to be an assessment of what does it mean to be now designing genetic engineered organisms, viruses, proteins through artificial intelligence, because we may be introducing a whole extra level of complexity here with these, these AI developed errors. As further background on all this, talk about why you also argue there needs to be technology assessment of the impact of generative biology on the lives and livelihoods of the world's primary providers of biological genetic resources, notably from biodiverse developing countries in the South. So smallholders, peasants, indigenous people who have served as stewards of the world's uh, biodiversity. So comment on dynamics at play there. Sure. And so 
every living thing in the world has uh, DNA. That's to say the uh, the sort of chemical code within its nucleus of its cells, um, which is thought to be the you know the the blueprint for how that organism develops, whether it's a flower or a, a animal or a bacteria. And um, the, those different codes, those different DNA codes, um, are what genetic engineers use to try and change how an organism grows um, by, by moving the DNA across. Um, so in many ways, that's the, that's the sort of raw resource for doing genetic engineering, is you take these, these, these pieces of DNA, these, these chemical pieces, and then move them across to other organisms, or you re-engineer the organisms in their cells in, in laboratory um, with these different codes. That's that's the theory, anyway. Um, and so, for the biotechnology industry, um, whether that's the, the plant biotechnology industry producing GM crops or the pharmaceutical industry trying to produce new drugs, um, this is sort of the raw resources where, by which they hope to reprogram living organisms. It's those codes that they've taken from nature. Um, and originally, the way this was done was literally taking seeds, taking bits of um, uh, bits of culture, you know, little little leaves and so forth. Um, and having physical pieces of DNA that were carried around the world and put into repositories. Um, but increasingly, you can, you can put them through something called a DNA sequencer, and you can record the code of the DNA. There's four chemical letters, G, T, C, and A. And so you now have these digital databases in which you have all the codes of the DNA for, for different animals, for different crops, for different bacteria, for different viruses. And that is what biotechnology companies, including synthetic biology companies, use to try and build new organisms or to build new proteins or to build new drugs. And so these 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 samples, the original samples that they've taken, the living samples, um, they they're they're samples taken from communities. They're they're taken from um, they're taken from farmers, they're taken from indigenous communities, they're taken from uh, ocean communities. And often they've been stewarded and looked after by those communities for, for generations upon generations. So it's, it's not like these are freely available or they should be considered freely available. They're, they were taken from, from the communities that have looked after biodiversity, that have bred seeds and breeds and, and protected the, the forest and the ocean and so forth. And so many, uh, many, many of us have been saying for years that the use of these genetic codes is is a form of piracy, what we call biopiracy, um, by the big pharmaceutical companies, by the big biotech companies, by food companies, um, that they are literally profiting off of the resources that they've taken from from the stewards of biodiversity, often some of the most marginal and poorest people in the world. And so the Convention on Biological Diversity very early on um, tried to agree processes by which if a, a genetic resource was taken and it was used in industry, there has to be a, a benefit going back to the original communities. And these processes, it was called ABS, access and benefit sharing, broke down because there stopped being physical material being passed around. It became digital material. Um, because it was possible to digitally build organisms or digitally build DNA and digitally store it all in these, these large uh, databases. And so that was part of the negotiations here was to say, okay, in the case where it's digital material, which is what most of it is these days, how does some benefit get back to, to the indigenous communities, the farming communities and others who originally uh, stewarded and looked after these, these resources? And the answer that's come up is not to actually pay them, but to pay into this other fund that they call the Kali Fund, some of which is supposed to go to indigenous communities, some of which is supposed to go to uh, supporting conservation efforts, um, some of which, frankly, will just go back to biotech industry through other routes. So it's, it's a really imperfect answer, and it, it breaks the connection between those who have looked after the... the, the um, the genetic resources and those who are exploiting them and making money out of them. You say the Kali Fund breaks the connection between those who looked after genetic resources and those who are exploiting those resources. Talk about the role played by what you call black box biotech in undermining 
the previous uh, CBD agenda to avoid biopiracy, so the appropriation of biological resources or traditional knowledge without proper compensation or consent. Yeah. Um, so originally, the way in which the Convention on Biological Diversity set up um, the question of what they call access and benefit sharing over genetic resources was they asked for a memorandum of understanding that if you take a, a seed or, or a sample from one place, from one community, and you're going to carry it across the world and give it to a, a biotech company, then you have to have a sort of paper trail um, and a memorandum of understanding of, of where that specific DNA sequencing came from and went to such that benefits could go back. It was creating a paper trail. Um, this has become harder and harder to track as you have large databases where you're not moving digital material. It's all being uploaded digitally into very large um, databases that are held by the US government or the Japanese government. Um, and then other companies will come in and scrape off of that. But you still could, absolutely could, track where the data they're taking comes from and where it ends up. This is all possible. Where it becomes even more complicated, however, is when you start to introduce artificial intelligence platforms. So the artificial intelligence platforms that are now coming out for designing genetic material, um, so-called generative biology, um, what they do is they scrape all the DNA data from all the databases and they use it to train an artificial intelligence model. And that model has millions, sometimes billions of different variables. Um, and, and then you ask a question of it and it generates a brand new novel, supposedly, piece of DNA or a brand new novel piece of protein, a sequence for protein. Um, and what the companies will often say is because this is because this artificial intelligence process um, is so tremendously complex that the many variables and the weights within the model it effectively becomes a black box. You you can't just tra track a line between what the data the data that comes in and the the the, the new novel uh, data that comes out the so called synthetic data. And therefore, the idea that you're going to be able to say that this invented piece of DNA comes from these other pieces of DNA that were taken from, uh, you know, from the South Pacific or from North Africa, it, it begins to break down within that model. Now, that then becomes an argument for this sort of general fund. It then says, okay, well, if we can't f trace it within the, within the model, um, then we'll have a general fund, anyone who uses this. Um, will pay into that fund and that fund will will pay you know to to indigenous people and and to farmers and so forth so that's the way in which this black box nature of artificial intelligence accelerates what's happening here interestingly enough in Kali I met with some of the artificial intelligence companies who were there and were lobbying and they said that they think they can trace um, they believe that they actually do trace um, and so it may be that the black box can be circumvented. It may be that you could um, request that an artificial intelligence company building one of these models has to be able to trace. And that's more work for them, but that would somewhat enforce justice. It would somewhat ensure that if you're designing a new genetic sequence, um, you, you would have to prove where it comes from. This is what's known as explainable AI. So, so it's, it may not be entirely impossible, but this is exactly the sort of thing that needs to be looked into. Earlier, you comment that you and other critics have been saying for years that the use of genetic codes is a form of biopiracy. Just to clarify, this refers to the CBD's previous, so its original protocol, under which any company using genetic resources was required to pay back benefits to the original provider communities, and this under an agreement um, made under the auspices of the CBD. Um, yes. I mean, if, 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 uh, if a company shows that they made an agreement and that they promised that they were going to give some kind of uh, benefit back to a community, that's legal biopiracy. And, and 
communities, peasant communities, indigenous communities have said this is an unfair system to begin with. You know, that if somebody breaks into your house, steals your television set and on the way out says, it's all right, I'll give you a benefit. But, I, you know, that's that's not necessarily something you've agreed to. Um, it's something that you kind of have to deal with. And that's how many communities feel that the often um, DNA was taken from them, samples were taken from them, but often it was taken decades or even centuries ago, um, you know, collecting for, for uh, botanical gardens, for example, without them understanding or agreeing to the many ways in which it could be used. Um, and now they're being told, it's all right, we'll give you some benefit if we make some money out of it. But they have lost sort of sovereign rights and um, control over the use of the, the resources that they've looked after, that they've developed. Um, so this is why it's such a a contentious and, and highly emotional topic, especially for um, indigenous and peasant communities. This is about the very resources that their lives and cultures uh, depend upon. As a further point on biopiracy, your Black Box Biotech report argues that the generative biology rush is being fueled by the world's largest digital tech companies and that it includes a bold biopiracy grab of all the world's digital sequence information on genomic resources. So as a North-South issue at COP16, did the issue of unequal exchange um, come up? So um, uh, unequal exchange between those utilizing genetic uh, resources, those user users primarily uh, in uh, developed nations of the North, versus those who provide genetic resources, so those uh, providers largely uh, in the biodiverse nations of the South. Many of the groups who were at the convention meeting in Cali, um, indigenous groups, civil society groups, women's groups, uh, were saying quite loudly that what's going on is a new wave of colonialism. Um, that through things like biodiversity markets and new technologies, uh, the same power players, whether that's financial players or tech players or, or l large northern industrial countries, um, are, are trying to grab power over territories, over life, um, and even over people's culture. Um, colonialism always comes uh, with, whether it's with gunboats or with, with uh, debt um, with with a narrative that that what's what's on the territory is worthless whether that's human lives or, or foods or now genes and bi biomass that all of this stuff isn't really worth anything and it should be handed over in exchange for trinkets um, in this case new technologies little bits of money in a fund um, that 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 in exchange for those, that the South should now hand over its its biodiversity, um, or or should put large areas of its biodiversity in uh, sort of fenced off spaces that will be controlled by northern conservation NGOs, which is the other thing that's going on. Um, and 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 I think you know now that the the technology is there to to sequence to 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 take codes from every living organism and put it into artificial intelligence um, models and generate new products in the North. Um, they're sort of offering little bits of money, trinkets of money, if you like, into this this fund, the Kali Fund, um, and, and promises that the South might get some of this technology through technology transfer in order to grab as much as possible of this genetic resources, of this biodiversity, and that that becomes the underlying resource for artificial intelligence companies like Google or Microsoft or NVIDIA or large pharmaceutical companies, whether that's uh, Pfizer or Johnson & Johnson or, or agribusiness companies like Corteva um, and uh, Bayer. Um, and, and the North wants to make sure that they have unfettered access uh, to as much genetic resources and, and biological diversity as possible to build out this different economy. So it, it is, you know, it's it's the same story that we see again and again. You come for territory, you come for human bodies, you come for food and commodities, and now you come for genetic commodities. It's, it's just a, a next phase of, of, of colonial exploitation. So give us some more details on how this Kali Fund is uh, going to be set up. 
you know, under this new Kali fund, uh, companies that are of a particular size, larger companies that depend on use of genetic resources in certain sectors are expected to pay 0.1% of their sales or 1% of their profits into the Kali fund. Um, so, so these are pharmaceutical companies, biotechnology companies, um, but most crucially, and, and what was perhaps a good news in uh, Kali, was they agreed that large artificial intelligence companies also have to pay into this because we're now seeing um, that with uh, the use of artificial intelligence platforms um, to try and invent or create, generate new life forms, what's called generative biology, these these firms are also now basically biopirates. They're also stealing large amounts of genetic data and trying to make money out of it. So you're saying it's good news that AI and generative biology companies are explicitly included, so explicitly named within the scope of the new Kali Fund. So along with big pharma, big biotech, and so on, uh, big AI and generative biology companies uh, have an obligation to pay for their use of genetic data. So there'll be some sort of mechanism to monitor and, and uh, these payment obligations. And will there be a binding enforcement mechanism? How is uh, that going to work? It's probably a voluntary mechanism. Um, and this is something that lawyers are going to work out, I suspect. The word that was agreed by uh, 196 countries was should. That, that large companies who use genetic resources should pay into this fund and pay into this fund at this level of the indicative rate is 0.1% of their sales or 1% of their profits. So should doesn't say must, but it very strongly expects that. And it's now for governments to turn that into reality. Um, the One of the biggest loopholes, of course, is that the, the one government that is not part of this, the United States of America, um, is the country that has many of these these companies. Um, so those companies, whether they're large artificial intelligence companies or large pharmaceutical companies, may well escape having to pay for this. Some may voluntarily pay something. Um, and there are probably other ways in which this language will be uh, poured over by lawyers to try and reduce the amount that companies will pay. But the, the, the intent is very clearly there. Uh, the world's governments agreed that those who use genetic resources, including artificial intelligence companies, should pay money into a fund that gets benefits back to the original developers or, 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 or stewards, rather, of these DNA seeds, plants, and so forth. And as you say, um, that's the intent. Now lawyers are going to pour over how this will operate, including details over um, what enforcement mechanism will be in place. So you say that the Cali Fund is probably going to have a voluntary mechanism. So having interviewed a lot of experts in intellectual property rights, so international law, what strikes me is how negotiators representing the interests of the global north uh, as large users of genetic resources got an agreement for a voluntary, most likely got an agreement for a voluntary mechanism uh, uh, over their obligations to pay into this Kali Fund and set up to return some benefits for uh, their use of genetic resources back uh, to where those resources came from, so primarily back to providers in the biodiverse developing country communities. On the other hand, these same interests enjoy a binding mechanism over obligations for payments due to them as intellectual property uh, rents uh, for use of their proprietary technology and or products, including uh, uh, those that have relied on the use of genetic resources for their commercial development. And the binding mechanism uh, is enforced by a legal framework of patent and other intellectual property rights is linked to trade. And the preeminent agreement being the 1995 WTO TRIPS agreement signed uh, with the creation of the World Trade Organization. Development economists and global governance experts, among others, have been talking about uh, a double standard in the international economic order for decades. So a power asymmetry of binding corporate rights versus voluntary corporate responsibilities at the international level. 
I expect public interest teams with expert advisors in international law will also be poring over this aspect of the Kali Fund given the connection between patents and biopiracy. As put by the ETC group, who originally coined the term, biopiracy, quote, refers to the appropriation of the knowledge and genetic resources of farming and indigenous communities by individuals or institutions that seek exclusive monopoly control, so patents or intellectual property, over these resources and knowledge. ETC Group believes that intellectual property is predatory on the rights and knowledge of farming communities and indigenous peoples. So in this clash of two agendas over who will benefit and who will control biological uh, resources, what are some, some observations you made at COP16 about uh, dynamics at play among some big governments of the global south and communities? There is often, often a question about at what level um, control should rest over biological resources, uh, whether it's seeds and breeds or... Um, the land and territories and and governments national governments often give up control much quicker than communities would um the, the or, or or request uh so-called benefits and i think this was sort of happening in cali where monies might go to for example the government of brazil um to allow them to create new science and technology institutions but not to the actual communities in the amazon or or, or on the ground who have actually done the, the the work of stewarding and looking after biodiversity so indigenous peoples and local communities have often said they would like uh, the benefits if there are benefits to go directly to the communities and not via the intermediary of governments who who are often um you know in hock to massive debts and have to pay off those debts and 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 under sort of development agreements to develop new biotechnologies, for example. Um, so I, I think that question of who who ultimately benefits and who retains control over biological resources, over um, over biomass, for example, is, is not always at the level of communities. I mean, I, I, what I would say is one of the things that's very clearly on display in Cali um, at the COP was this hope by... Um, by governments, big big South governments such as Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, um, that they would be able to to create a new uh, bio economy, that by by using genetic engineering, artificial intelligence, synthetic biology, they would create a new high tech economy um, that would let them sort of leapfrog ahead. Um, and the promise is there as well from from financiers, from big philanthropists like the Bezos Earth Fund, um, that the way to get beyond the current carbon economy, the fossil fuel economy, is to create a high tech economy based on new technologies, uh, genetic engineering, um, and artificial intelligence. And and so this this was on view this this attempt to create a sort of high tech financialized version of nature. And, and the economy around nature was part of what's going on. Give us some historic context on the push for a bioeconomy and how the CBD has responded over the last 25 to 30 years, uh, so from its founding days into this current clash of two agendas at COP16. You know, back in 1992 at the Earth Summit and thereafter when the Convention on Biological Diversity was being negotiated, there were environmental negotiators, policymakers around the world who were really concerned about how what's now being called the bioeconomy, the biotech industry, was gaining power over, um, over the very stuff of life, over genes, over biomaterial, over biodiversity. And um, so wrote that convention in a way that tried to uh, tried to hold back biopiracy and the um, the, the grabbing of, of nature as, as a new commercial frontier um, for 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 large biotech companies. And so what we've seen for the last 25 years um, coming out of the Convention on Biodiversity are many quite good decisions um, around trying to assess the risks of genetically engineered organisms. We have something called the Cartagena Protocol that exists exactly for this reason, trying to make sure that if there is um, 
DNA taken, um, that there is some kind of benefit negotiated back to the communities. And that's where we have what's called the Nagoya Protocol um, on access and benefit sharing. Um, trying to make sure there's liability, which we have the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur protocol, and also various decisions around um, trying to stop some of the worst developments, such as terminator seeds, which are seeds that are sterile, so that the company has to is able to keep selling them every year to farmers, and farmers can't keep them. Um, but it's true that at the you know the kind of the fundamental bargain that was agreed at the beginning of the convention. Um, the U.S. and other com other countries, industrial countries, were saying, "Well, we hope we can make a market in this stuff. That by agreeing a benefit sharing arrangement, um, genetic resources, DNA, and so forth, will will become part of a market, and and that is now what's on full display. Um, that this idea that that uh, that the South should." Um, should hoover up as much of its genetic resources as possible. And, and, and in Kali, we had a number of companies there who were offering to do what's called eDNA scans. They were offering communities that they would just be basically sampling again and again environmental DNA. Uh, and that in turn will be go into a fund where you'll get a little bit of money off the back. And all of that will, will run these artificial intelligence platforms that will create new drugs, new plastics, new materials, new foods, um, which will benefit, frankly, largely the North. Um, that's, that's now the full game. Um, it's, it's how can uh, nature become a source of commercial opportunity for, for banks, for tech companies, uh, for northern investors, and the South will will provide the underlying resources. Will, will provide the the genes, the DNA, um, and and the biodiversity, and get a small a small bit of money in a fund such as the Carly Fund off the back of that. So that's that's sort of the the restatement of of what was originally uh, struck as a deal uh, twenty five years ago, twenty five or thirty years ago. Um, and now it's now it's quite naked that this is uh, this is about trying to create a different economy, a potentially post fossil fuel economy is how it's presented, uh, an economy that's supposedly about nature based solutions. Um, it's a green economy. All of these things were being said very loudly by, for example, the Bezos Earth Fund, which is of course the largesse of uh, Jeff Bezos, um, who's one of the major investors in this. Um, and some of the large South governments, Brazil, Argentina, and others, are happy to go along with this vision in the hope that they might build high-tech sectors along the way. Jim, can you take us deeper into the history of CBD governance responses to key developments in biotechnology uh, from its founding into the present? Yeah, certainly. At the time that the Convention on Biological Diversity was being negotiated, uh, policymakers had very clearly in their mind that these new genetically engineered crops were coming, that they just started to be trialed, they were coming to the market, and they, they wanted to set up a system that both mitigated against the risks of these crops, the, the threats to biodiversity and the questions of biosafety, um, and also dealt with the, uh, the justice questions, that these were built on uh, genetic resources that had been taken away from communities and who weren't properly compensated or biopiracy was taking place. And it's been interesting through the last 25 to 30 years of the convention, how the convention has seen new developments in biotechnology um, and responded to them. For example, when it became apparent that companies were developing seeds that were sterile, that couldn't reproduce in order to force farmers every year to buy new seeds rather than save them. Um, the Convention on Biodiversity put in place a moratorium on those sterile seeds, what are called terminator seeds. Um, when it became apparent that the direction of genetic engineering was moving into a more digital way with synthetic biology, um, the Convention on Biodiversity set up a process to look at uh, this question of synthetic biology and restated again the importance of precaution um, that, that governments need to set up regulations and, and act in a precautionary way. Um, and then when it became clear that there was under synthetic biology, there were um, 
organisms being developed which would take over entire populations, what are called gene drives, and would spread intentionally in the environment, uh, the convention also dealt with the question of gene drives and talked about the importance of precaution and, and having free prior and informed consent from communities who would be affected by this. So at every stage, the parties in the convention have tried to respond to how the biotechnology industry is moving ahead. What's interesting is um, at this meeting in Kali, there, there has been set up a process of horizon scanning, assessment and monitoring to try and see new developments, to try and respond to them. And a few countries very close to the biotechnology industry tried to kill that. Um, there was actually a proposal by, by one country, it's, I can't say which because these, are, these discussions are done behind closed doors, who asked for the disestablishment of that process. Um, and and then tried to delete all of the work that's been done in the last two years, looking at new horizon scanning. In fact, pretty effectively, they did delete it. Um, and, and one of the things that the convention was expected to do was to request new, deeper assessment of genetic engineering fusing with artificial intelligence, this the so-called generative biology, and they didn't. That was blocked. Um, that the same countries who really want to financialize biodiversity, who really want to um, take advantage of this, this new Kali fund, who want to have these new technologies transferred to them, um, were blocking the opportunity to assess or do horizon scanning, scanning or monitor these technologies, effectively asking that the convention stops uh, you know, sort of covers its eyes with the impacts and just takes the money to develop the technology. Um, and that that's what the industry wants. The industry wants this this uh, convention not to be a, a critical, reflective um, uh, space to, to properly oversee and regulate biotechnology, but to be a promotional space where, where monies can, can gather together to, to build the biotechnology industry and the promise of techno fixes. And so that was that was one of the, the the downsides of this meeting was that where there should have been stuff moved ahead to look at artificial intelligence impacts, uh, to look at other other risky uh, uses of synthetic biology, that was that was just blocked. On the topic of technology assessment being blocked uh, within the UN system, it's interesting to note that uh, to quote. One year after the 1992 Earth Summit, the two organs in the United Nations system with a mandate to assess technologies were virtually eradicated. The UN Center on Transnational Corporations, the only international body capable of monitoring private sector technologies and practices, was shut down entirely. At the same time, the UN Center for Science and Technology for Development was dismantled. Shortly afterward, the U.S. government closed down its respected Office of Technology Assessment. So in the case of the UN CBD, where do things stand after COP16? Has the technology assessment capability of the CBD also been entirely shut down? It wasn't entirely shut down, but it was, it was very much reduced to a trickle, if you like. Um, the the call for technology assessment has been one of the key calls that uh, that some of the more precautionary governments have made, um, and it has been quite a fight over the last eight to nine years to set up a what's called a broad and regular process on horizon scanning, assessment, and monitoring of synthetic biology. But it was established in the Convention on Biodiversity, and it was established by two different decisions, um, so it's it's there. Um, but the, the countries that are close to the biotechnology industry have continually tried to shut that down and stop that. Um, and, and the same, you know, the same fight is happening elsewhere. Um, the, for example, the, the UN um, Commission on Science and Technology for Development, based in Geneva, is now moving ahead with assessment of new and emerging technologies. Um, and other bodies are also trying to put in place the the ability to assess new technologies that, as as you say, was uh, was removed with with the shutting down of of the UN Center on Transnationals and so forth. Um, 
it, it's it's a sort of very basic common sense request that if you're going to put lots of money and energy and political time into promoting new technologies, you also need to understand how they're going to impact people, how they're going to impact nature, how they're going to impact economies. And um, industry doesn't want to have those discussions. They just want to move ahead with funding mechanisms. So, the run, Jim, the rundown of COP16 that, that you posted on October uh, 31st stated that uh, uh, there was a block of countries at COP16 negotiations that take their orders from biotech and agribusiness interests that go under the acronym CANJAB, uh, standing for Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Argentina, and Brazil. You stated in the report that CANJAB plus the UK entirely denigrated and sidelined the work of the UN CBD's own expert group and forced a pivot in uh, negotiations at COP16 to the, what you call a CBD 4.0 agenda. And you, and you wrote, quote, by introducing a thematic action plan on capacity building and tech transfer, CANJAB plus the UK crafted an industry promotion package for synthetic biology, positioning biotech as the source of shiny, innovative solutions, so technofixes, that could be matched to the targets of the KMGBF and therefore made eligible for funding. And there can be no illusion. CANJAB plus the UK will continue to block actual decisions or assessments from here on every two years, all the while expanding the SynBio industry promotion package. So give us the story on CANJAB and the devil in the detail with the pivot to technology transfer as part of this CBD 4.0 agenda. Well, CANJAB, as you say, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Argentina, Brazil, form a block uh, that came into these negotiations saying we don't want the topic of synthetic biology, we don't want assessment, we don't want horizon scanning, all we want is basically an industry promotion package around the benefits. And they argued very strongly that the only things that should move ahead on the topic of synthetic biology were an assessment of the benefits, and not even an assessment, actually a listing of the benefits, and how the benefits could support uh, what's called the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, that is to say the sort of plan for biodiversity for the next 10, 20 years. Um, and so they, you know, what they wanted was for a process which would list, here are the good things, the good techno fixes we could make with synthetic biology, here's how that could line up with things we want to do under this convention, and that in turn would set them up for receiving funding under the biodiversity funds that are being set up. So that was that was the approach they were going for. Um, and they tried to entirely stop and kill the horizon scanning assessment and monitoring process. In the end, um, some regions, parts of Africa, particularly Europe, uh, pushed hard and said, no, we absolutely want the horizon scanning assessment and monitoring. And so there is a very sort of limited uh, horizon scanning capability uh, there will be an expert group set up. It will be a technical expert group, not a multidisciplinary expert group. And that technical expert group will look at positive and negative implications of synthetic biology. That's the kind of extent to which CANJAB allowed some sort of assessment. But the thrust of what was mostly going ahead is around capacity building in new technologies, about transferring technology, and about development of new industries. That's the thing that they wanted to move ahead fastest. So that's uh, that's unfortunately not a great outcome in terms of precaution, the rights of indigenous and local communities, um, or considering the risks that could come from this technology. Okay, and, and what about the technology transfer issue? Technology transfer has become an increasing demand in the Convention on Biodiversity, and it's supported very much by by African and Latin American and um, Asian countries, um, who hope that if new emerging technologies such as synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, are transferred to their economy, then these will, you know, help boost their economy. Um, the 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 problem is technology transfer you know, it's which technologies get transferred and how do we make sure they're not technology dumping? 
um, that very often when a technology is failing in the north, such as, um, for example, incineration, then it gets transferred to the south and the south has to deal with its impacts. Um, sometimes the transfer of technology is a way of, uh, of opening up new markets that are then tied to having to you know, use the expertise and technologies of northern companies. And that would just drive countries deeper into debt um, or create agricultural systems or other systems that aren't appropriate to their own culture. That's why technology transfer has to be tied with technology assessment. You have to see whether the technologies are appropriate to the cultures and, and the, the environments into which they're, and the economies into which they're being transferred, and that they don't come with strings, that they don't come with dependencies. Um, they, they, that's, that's a very real risk. Unfortunately, you know, at the Convention on Biodiversity, as elsewhere, southern countries are dealing with cripplingly high loads of debt, and they're being promised easy ways out, that if you just jump onto the biotech bandwagon, if you just jump onto the, the bandwagon of digitalization and artificial intelligence, this will get you out of the, the, the economic straits that the countries are in. Um, of course it doesn't. It's, it's, a, it's potentially a trick. It gets them deeper into those economic straits. The, the underlying problem here are, are the, the historical debts that, that they've been forced into and, and structurally adjusted into. Um, that's actually the thing that needs to be dealt with, not giving them new techno fixes that may not work and may tie them more to, uh, to all sorts of obligations. So you say technology transfer has to be tied to technology assessment, that you have to see whether technologies are appropriate uh, to the cultures and environments and economies into which they're going to be transferred. So to illustrate that, and other points you've been making about uh, uh, the use of uh, technology more generally and specifically uh, with respect to generative biology, talk more about uh, the future of food and agriculture. So let's bring that into the mix. I suppose in the face of all of the, the many threats to biodiversity, the climate um, and, and so forth, there are different routes you could go for, for food and agriculture and sustainable development. Um, one is to really support uh, systems such as agroecology, where, where you're supporting communities on the land to use their own knowledge and their own techniques appropriate to their, their own place. Um, where synthetic biology, artificial intelligence and these technologies fit is a very different route. It's a sort of high-tech control vision that uh, in face of all the, uh, the threats to the biosphere and, and, and uh, to biodiversity, uh, states and companies will create a sort of high-tech control and command of food production, of, of biodiversity, of, of um, carbon capture and so forth. Um, and and that's, that, that pushes the power and agency of communities out, out of the way. Their land becomes a, a resource for genetic information that, that, that feeds the AI systems. It also becomes necessary to control their lands and territories in order to grow enough food in a sort of, uh, in, in, the, in an industrial food chain. Um, and their knowledge, so far as it's relevant, has been hoovered up by artificial intelligence and used to, to generate commercial products that will be sold back to them. So um, I, I honestly think where this heads is, is that the knowledge of, of communities, of indigenous people, of farmers, of fisher folk, um, gets more and more marginalized if you build your food systems, your health systems, your, your environmental systems around these high-tech fixes. So we've been talking today about the argument that there's an urgent need for technology assessment of the impact of generative biology on people, on nature, people's livelihoods, so on economies. As a closing thought, talk more broadly on the argument that there's a need for technology assessment. Every society, every culture uses technologies and develops technologies that are appropriate to their needs. And, um, and so long as the community is able to exercise control over those technologies and develop them to fit their, their culture, 
then those those technologies are helpful and useful. Um, the danger I think we have now is that we have technologies that are being determined and driven and imposed, not not at the level of communities, uh, not at the level of specific cultures, but at, by by corporate strategies that that fit the bottom line. Um, that we we need to therefore have processes to to determine which are the appropriate technologies. That's why technology assessment has become such a major rallying call for movements and civil society. Um, that unless unless we can begin to exercise um, discrimination over which technologies move forward, which technologies are appropriate to to, to communities and the rights of communities, and um, and ensure that there's there's choice made on, on the right technologies to move forward through assessment, um, you're going to have the, the technologies of, of the elites, of, of those who can, who can push their technologies onto society, then reshape society. So it's a, you know, the, the bigger call here is about agency and democratic accountability in development of new technologies. And assessment is one of the first steps towards that. Jim Thomas, thank you. Yes, welcome. And thank you for joining us.